Thank you all for coming. I'm Cameron Smith. I'm Vice President and General Counsel at the R Street Institute. Uh, the R Street Institute is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, free market think tank um, that focuses on sound public policy and sound governance. Uh, this series that we're here for today is part of our congressional exit interview series. Uh, we did one with Congressman Jimmy Duncan uh, from Tennessee already. Uh, upcoming, we have uh, Chairman Goodlatte and Chairman Smith. Um, as well as Congressman Poe uh, to talk about their experience here. Today we have Congressman Ryan Costello and Congressman Dennis Ross. And the idea of these exit interviews is an opportunity to ask members questions when they're not standing for reelection. Uh, obviously, political dynamics come into play anytime a camera is rolling, people are in the room. Um, we think that the institution of Congress itself is very important. The dynamics of how Congress works is something worth investigating further. And to that end, we wanted to ask departing members questions about their experience in a way um, that we can present and talk to others about. So I want to thank both of y'all for joining us today. Um, with that, I, I would, I'd like to, if it's all right with y'all, just dive right into some of the questions. Um, Congressman Costello, we'll start with you, um, and y'all can both answer this question if you don't mind. If you can go back to the first few months of your congress congressional career, right when you started, you won election, you showed up, got the pin, what, what would you tell yourself in hindsight? If you could look back and say, here's a piece of advice starting out your congressional career, what would it be? Not to spread yourself too thin or feel that you have to meet with everyone immediately who requests a meeting with you because you're already drinking from a fire hose in terms of understanding what um, the mandatory demands are on your time and I think at least for me but I suspect that it's universal you just want to do good. And so part of doing good is meeting with everybody that wants to meet with you because you feel like they have something to offer. And I'm sure that they do. But I also think that, you know, keep in an hour or two to yourself every day just to breathe a little easier and a little deeper and give yourself some moments of self-reflection and, and do a little extra reading is probably the best advice I would give to someone coming in and something that um, I probably would have done a little bit more of. Because you do really spread yourself thin, even if you don't try to. Congressman Ross? Now, I concur with Ryan in that regard. And I also would just add that when, when you get elected, you are so overwhelmed with having just run a successful campaign, the yeah. next thing you have to do is open up an office, not only up here, but also in the district. Be involved in the... Um, hiring of your personnel, uh, just to the extent at least that you get to know them before they're offered the job, because uh, you need, loyalty is one of the rarest qualities to find in this particular process, and having the opportunity to meet with these people that are going to be hopefully working with you as your staff is going to be very important, and in addition to what Ryan says about s scheduling time for yourself, make sure you don't surround yourself with yes people. You need somebody to, to keep you humble. Uh, because everybody else up here will do their best to inflate your ego. Not everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, off that, just a little bit, if you were writing a job description for a member of Congress, what would you say are the attributes, um, pick one or two, that make for successful representation? If you are talking to your successors and saying, in order to be successful, you need these characteristics and need to focus on them. What would those be, Congressman Costello? Well, uh, live a healthy lifestyle uh, and because there are long days and uh, there is an expectation that you will always be on. Um, that would be one thing. Uh, the other thing would be have some humility and find the humor in things because you know, people are going to be mean, people are going to take shots at you, and if you can just kind of see the comedy in how ridiculous, sometimes it's legitimate, and you do need that feedback, and that's where the humility comes in, but sometimes it's, it can be far-fetched, and that's where if you can take the, you see the humor in it rather than take it personal, I think that that's uh, very important. And then the other thing I would say is do your best to be 
um, open-minded or what I would say intellectually and by dexterous. And by that, don't assume that what you think is the only way of thinking or that your perspective is right because you read a bunch of books and you felt that way your whole life. There's a lot of smart people here. And the best way to marshal support and make your best argument is to know what the best arguments are uh, contrary to your position. And the people uh, around Capitol Hill and on Capitol Hill are, are very resourceful and are the ones that can provide you the, those counter arguments and the counter narrative to what you may think is correct. Sure. Uh, briefly, I would just have to say that you have to be uh, anchored to something outside this process, whether mm -hmm. it be your faith or your family, because you have to remember this is a job. It's what you do. It's not who you are. And if you can maintain that, I think you can be successful in your duties as a member of Congress. Let's turn to talk about leadership for a moment because I, I think that's a question that pops up regularly. Congressman Ross, you've served under a number of speakers. Uh, Congressman Costello, you have experience with these, this leadership structure. What, what does the speaker's role mean in terms of the flow of Congress? How can a congressman or congresswoman's interaction with the speaker affect their representation? And is there anything in terms of leadership structure, the structure itself, rather than the individual people, that you would want to see changed in order to make the House operate more effectively? Uh, so I, Speaker Boehner, Speaker Ryan, I, I don't have any criticisms of their leadership style. Uh, largely, it's a function of how strong their staffs are and I would you know I put McCarthy and Scalise in that mix too just in terms of you know it's a staff to staff function you go to the speaker and you say hey this is very important hey talk to you know Susie Q about this and that stuff gets done um, so I, I think that that um, that works very well look I'm gonna be blunt um, the biggest problem to governing and getting stuff done and moving forward to the next issue for me has been the Freedom Caucus's desire to anchor everything their way and this absolutist uh, perspective that if they don't get their way then we're all just selling out and that requires extra votes before we get to the real vote that revolve that involves a lot of pushback from your conservative base rather than realizing that there's 15 other issues that we need to get to and we're not all going to agree on everything uh, and the more that we're fighting over the perfect rather than this is sufficient this is good let's keep the ball rolling that that becomes an extremely difficult management uh, problem for leadership and so leadership oftentimes for for me sometimes the frustration would be with leadership not because they were doing something that, that that I disagreed with but because they had to do what they needed to do in order for us to actually get to the vote that we needed to get to in order to move the ball forward. Congressman Ross. And, and to further build on that because I concur with that in some regards that you have a situation where the tail's wagging the dog. Uh, there are those of us that are in relatively safe seats that, 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 that try to move the team along in the right direction and then you see some of our extreme sides trying to pull us up, uh, uh, to, to, the, to the other side and then we accomplish nothing. You know, um, being speaker is one of the most thankless, hardest jobs there, there absolutely is. But the one thing that I have to say that I, I think will probably be blasphemous to some of my colleagues is that you have to reach across the aisle. Uh, if you want to get something accomplished, you can't think that all Republicans are going to go your way and it's going to be ideal because, as Ryan pointed out, you have one faction that says it's going to go our way or no way, and it usually goes no way because not everybody's going to go that way. And so you have to be able to reach across the aisle. There was a time here where you had Blue Dog Democrats that played a significant, significant role in accomplishing a conservative agenda. And I would have to agree with, with Ryan, you know, the, 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 uh, the perfect is the enemy of the good in this process right now because we try to make it all one party's idea and no one party has a monopoly on all good ideas. And the hardest thing for a speaker to do is to say, in order to get this accomplished, in order to at least get 70% of what I think we need, I've got to reach across the aisle because that may be the death knell for that speaker. And I would add to that. Uh, when you hear, oh, you know, the speaker, and, and not, not any particular speaker in particular, but the speaker's ruling with an iron fist, okay, 
that's actually code for a speaker cutting through the BS and just getting to the <laughs> bottom line and not not entertaining uh, or allowing the tail to take over. I, I want to so build off that with a specific question and then moving to some broader questions about house process. Do either of you think or that a majority of the majority caucus should be required to bring legislation to the floor or should it be easier to get legislation on the floor and have votes when we don't know how they'll go? Well, look, the latter obviously is you're going to is um, you're going to get more stuff on the floor, right? Be sure. Because you can find that majority. Uh, I, I tend to think there's always the exception to the rule. I think the rule that you have a majority of the majority is is essential for purposes of look. We're a two party system, and Congress is set up to be a two party system. There, there, there is a lot of very good reasons, public policy reasons, why you have a majority of the majority. It helps set the agenda. It helps leadership determine what's ripe, what still needs to be work, worked on. Um, but there, isn't, there are exceptions to even that rule. And you've seen a couple times this year where we've gone the discharge petition route. Now, I'm, all, I'm, I'm fine with discharge petitions. That's me. I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. Uh, Dennis may have an alter a little bit different perspective, and most members probably have an alternating perspective on that. I never voted against a rule. That was my thing. I think, look, if it's – and to me, that's a majority of the majority vote, right? So if it's, pr if it's prepared to go to the floor and it's been hashed out in the majority party's um, committee process and leadership, we'll have the vote. I might not vote for the substantive bill on the floor, but – from a process perspective, it's right to go to the floor. Um, whereas on the discharge petition route, that's actually a mechanism, which I don't think is a bad mechanism, but that actually is the mechanism to get something to the floor that, to the floor that does not have the majority of the majority. So the exception to the rule has a mechanism that enables it to get to the floor. Congressman Ross. You know, the, the irony of this is the first vote that any member takes in every new session uh, in, has, in my experience, violated the majority of the majority rule, and that's for Speaker. Because we go into a conference as Republicans, and we, as a majority, elect who we're going to nominate as Speaker, and then we should all support that person if we believe in the majority of the majority, and then we go to the House floor, and all of a sudden, there are these nominations from the floor, Republican members themselves, now running for Speaker, violating the majority of the majority rule. Which but but also. but getting booked on television that night. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, yes, and regularly. Um, and, and so, and, and you've got to have a respect for the process, and be honest with procedure. And to that end, I would like to see us have a procedure that says if you get 225 uh, co-sponsors on any bill, that 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 has an automatic uh, opportunity to be heard in committee. And if it comes out of committee, it ought to be heard on the floor, up or down. Um, we're going to have, as we saw in this last session, we're going to have some bills that just don't pass. But that's okay. That's what this process is. It is a process by which we deliberate issues and amend those issues until we get a majority of it out of the House. As for the discharge positions, I came very, very close. In fact, I was a holdout, one of the last two holdouts on the discharge petition with regard to immigration and my on DACA and my concern was is that we were not addressing the issue that we so desperately campaigned on and so desperately need to address with regard to a, a, a visa program that's been a, a disaster with regard to guest worker program that has been a, a disaster with regard to a, a border security that has been a disaster and if we're not going to address this yes I'll sign a discharge petition in order to at least have it come to the floor. Uh, just one follow-up point. Uh, I think Dennis makes some very uh, good arguments. Here's a counter to the issue of 225 signatures, getting a hearing, getting something to the floor. Um, you have a budget, right? We have spending caps, you know, that, that whole bit. Um, every single, you know, so now we're going to spend, you know, X amount of dollars on something that we all love and believe in. You get every Democrat, then you just need to find your 40 Republicans. Then all of a sudden you flood the zone, get stuff out of committee. So there's, a, there's ways, uh, and some are in good faith, some may not be, in order to, to unwind some of the reasons why House leadership uh, doesn't support 
uh, majority the majority. There's, there's al again, there's always exceptions to the rules, but I, I, I think Dennis makes some very good points there. So going to the broader point of process and procedure, if you could wave a magic wand, change one thing about process and procedure in the House, what would it be and why? Uh, I have to, I'd have to reflect on that a little bit more. Uh, by and large, I think the process works the, uh, the way that it should. I really genuinely do. You know, if you go back historically, I mean, it's the frustrations that many of us have over why things don't get done are rooted in the tensions inherent between the House and the Senate, or in f the concept of federalism between uh, the state, the states, and the federal government, um, or between the presidency and Congress, or between the regulatory agencies and judicial interpretation that that gives them more power than Congress in terms of uh, certain rulemaking abilities. So, I, off the top of my head, I'd have to think about that. Dennis will probably say something brilliant, and then I'll be like, <laughs> "I agree, all, I agree with brilliant. Dennis." <laughs> no, but my mind is very simple. It's earmarks. Oh you know, yeah, that's for, I'm for that. P politically, we <laughs> said, "Oh my gosh, the public hates earmarks. It's a minuscule fraction of our budget." Yep. What they don't like is a lack of transparency, because an earmark should be a transparent appropriation for an essential government function that there is an immediate need, whether it be a bridge that has collapsed, whether it be as a waterway that needs repair, or in my case, in the state of Florida, where you just had a, a hurricane come through and we need immediate disaster relief, but you can't because it's a earmark. <laughs> All you have to do with the process is make sure that it has is yeah. heard, that it's that it's transparent, and let the members vote on it. And let me follow up on that. We're in a we're in a very politically polarized environment. You're either an R or you're a D. It is becoming increasingly difficult to make your mark something separate or beyond your party affiliation. And there's a, there's reasons for that other than what I'm about to say. But just consider that if your hometown has a bridge that just fell and it's an hour and a half traffic jam every single day additionally because the bridge isn't built or an airport that needs it or a lot whatever it is your ability to get that x millions of dollars into your district is well beyond partisanship and those are the kind of things that voters look at and say my guy or gal is getting it done in dc i don't like a bunch of the hoopla that goes on down there but by golly that person's fighting for me. When you don't have that ability to do that, number one, oftentimes you lose the, the justification for why you voted for the you-know-what sandwich that we all have to vote <laughs> for at the end of every single year. E earmarks is a way to, I don't want to say impose party discipline, it, but it's a way to justify why you went out and made a tough vote on something. And your voters will get that because they're seeing an actual result, not a huge trillion plus dollar spending bill. So in terms of, you talk about what voters get back home. Uh, one of the things I hear from members and as a former staffer, I saw this uh, working for our street, we have folks that work in the states and focus on the states, and we have an office here in D.C. A lot gets lost in translation. A lot of people in flyover country, if you will, look at the swamp. They call it the swamp. They don't understand what happens in the swamp. As a member, what do you do to effectively communicate to constituents back home what's happening here? How do you make decisions as to what you try to communicate versus what you say, hey, this is a, an issue that folks just don't care about? I have my weekly newsletter. That's, that's my best way to l get right to my constituents that sign up for it. And that's, where was I last week? Put a couple pictures in there. Do a poll question on something that kind of sizzles to keep them interested and get feedback. Um, and say how I voted on whatever it was, why I did, and what it accomplishes. You know, I, in addition to that, we, we telephone town uh, Halls while we're up here to, to talk to our constituents, uh, live town halls. But most importantly, it's constituent services. You know, what matters most to our people back home is whether they get their VA benefits, their Medicare is paid for, uh, or their benefits are paid, their Social Security is on time, their widow benefits, their Social Security disability. You know, a lot of what we do doesn't ever make the news. It, it doesn't make uh, headlines but it's so desperately needed by our constituents back home. And I think if you have good constituent services, and one of the hardest jobs for anybody on congressional staff is being a caseworker. Because you, you, you take these calls every day, people are desperate, they're in need, and they've gotta be 
the one who has to deal with the bureaucratic morass in trying to get this constituents uh, issue resolved. Talk to me a little bit about con Congress's relationship with the executive branch. I mean, we can track it, Bush administration, Obama administration, Trump administration, where we've seen the executive grow in power and reach and scope. Ostensibly, Congress is the first branch, has the lawmaking responsibility. How is Congress, in terms of operating as an independent branch, holding the executive accountable, that, that obviously is difficult when the president's of the same party, that sort of thing. How, how can Congress do a better job fulfilling its constitutional responsibility as a as a co-equal branch of government? Uh, I actually thought the, the first part of your question, I was actually thought you were going to ask me how do we interact with them staff to staff on casework and things of that sort, which I've actually found this administration to be extremely good. Um, you know, behind the scenes in terms of staffer to staffer. What do you need? How can we be help, helpful? And the Obama administration, honestly, my first term, it was kind of hard to keep, and this isn't a, a, a pejorative reflection on that administration in as much as it was just me trying to figure out what the heck was going on. Um, but even there, I think that the administration congressional relations are, are fairly good because we're all trying to do the right thing. To your question, uh, my feeling is so many folks – right now who who do this critique on uh, oversight between Congress and this administration um, <laughs> first everyone wants an independent council then we have an independent council then the independent council does their job now they want additional congressional investigations on whatever the jurisdiction is for the independent council so it's never good enough doesn't matter what you do they're just gonna criticize no matter what you do it will never be good enough unless you resist and oppose everything um, I, but let's just get out of that space and look on EPA, okay? How many open investigations are there on Pruitt? What do the, what do the IG's reports say? And so we have these inspector generals, which, is, which are embedded in each agency, that we get those reports. And we turn around and we ask Administrator X or Administrator B or Secretary whatever. I actually think that th that oversight function is performed – um, in good faith, very effectively by Congress vis-a-vis -vis the administration. Most people don't look at that oversight function. Instead, they look at, you know, what's sizzling on cable television and say, oh, you're not doing enough. Or if the president says something that you kind of shake your head at, so all of a sudden they want us to investigate it. And it's like, the president said something. What do you want me to investigate? He's allowed to talk. Uh, but on the actual substantive functions, I actually think – if you look at when we get an IG report or we ask an IG to investigate something or there's a GAO report on some sort of spending mishap, we, we, we drill down and ask the tough questions. You know, the, uh, the irony, again, if I might just on your marks go back to that, is that we say they're very bad, but yet we appropriate dollars so that the, the administrative <laughs> branch can have your marks. They do whatever they want with they it. They do whatever yeah. they want with it. Uh, and the second part of this is that we have ceded so much congressional authority to administrative agencies that we can't retake control and we need to retake control. We have, we have delegated so much authority uh, to the, the EPA or whatever administrative agency out there that with a faceless uh, bureaucrat who's making decisions that are not being uh, done openly as it would be in a congressional hearing, they promulgate rules. Um, and then you have to go through the Administrative Procedures Act to, 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 to address that. Uh, we need to regain a lot of our congressional authority that we've ceded to these agencies. Is there, I mean, are there specific mechanisms that you point to and say, this piece of legislation would help us do that? Yeah, the RAINS Act was a, was a fine example. Yeah. You know, we we want to be able to say, okay, what is, the, what is the financial impact of this particular regulatory rule? If it's a certain amount, then we need to be able to re, 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 retake that or we at least put it in abeyance until Congress has a chance to vote on it. Uh, those, those types of impacts that are come from the regulatory environment need to have almost direct automatic congressional oversight so that we can say, yes, this is good or bad. Some of our Dodd-Frank legislation to rein in CFPB. Yes. Uh, I would also say, you know, uh, there are those on the left 
that are highly critical of what the, admin, the HHS has done in the realm of the Affordable Care Act. And my response is, you're the one that supported the law. You're the one, I mean, a previous Congress wrote into the law, which divested Congress of a lot of its legislative function in the healthcare realm and just handed it over to the executive branch. So you can't be bothered, you can't go blame Congress when the executive branch takes the power that you ceded to them and, and changes a policy from what you used to like to what you don't like because that's what you wanted. That's what you supported if you supported the Affordable Care Act at the time. Uh, let's talk a little bit about spending. I, I was going to try to create a flowery question on this topic, but it's, is that it's, possible? It, it's, it's not possible right now. I, is, co is Congress over fiscal responsibility? If you don't have, to Dennis's point earlier on, if you don't have both parties willing to um, put up a tough vote, on what are the real cost drivers, mm -hmm. then you're not going to get it passed. You need 60 votes in the Senate. And so you really, from my vantage point, need to design um, th those, those, that kind of spending discipline in a House-passed bill that can get 60 votes in the Senate. And that doesn't exist. And frankly, Democrats, I mean, anytime you provo propose any spending reforms, all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're the bad guys. So, and you have a president who um, has been, I mean, during the campaign, he's not, he's not, he's not going to touch the cost drivers. The uh, silent killer of this country is our debt and deficit. There's no question about that. And we've campaigned on it many times. We watched it grow under both administrations. And now we're in an economic growth that we haven't seen in a very, very long time. 4% sustained GDP for two quarters from what used to be an average of 2.8% for about eight years. We need to commit that growth, portion of that growth, to reduce our debt and deficit. I introduce and have introduced every year, that every session I've been here, a zero-based budgeting act that would require the agencies to come forward to Congress and requ request their budgeting based on their one constitutional statutory authority, uh, but also uh, offering three amounts, two of which were less than last year's. because. As you see what we do here, we just incrementally increase every year and year. And you're not going to get us out of debt and deficit without addressing spending, unless you have economic growth, where part of that growth is dedicated to reducing the debt and deficit. We're not that disciplined. And I don't care who's in charge, Republicans or Democrats, we have to address our debt and deficit. And it's a, it's a, it's a generational uh, challenge. Uh, it's not going to resolve itself overnight, but we have to be on path to do that, and we have to hold our successive Congresses accountable to doing that. I think that's the one thing we haven't done and that needs to be done. Again, to the point of specifics, I mean, I think a lot of people see that. I mean, this is a basic math problem. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you run deficits every year, it's very, very hard to address your debt. Um, You're and, assuming logic and reason is our compass. Right. I mean, th th this, is, this is pretty straightforward. Do you see any legislative vehicles, any mechanisms, it could be as straightforward as, hey, let's have a normal appropriations process where we split it up into multiple bills. It could be caps. Uh, are there any specifics you can point to and say, hey, this would help move us in a better direction? Well, I mean, <coughs> you do have the, 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 the growth argument, which I subscribe to, which is for every 10th of a point increase in GDP averaged over 10 years, you're looking at another half a trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. And that was, I feel that the tax cut package, coupled with many of the regulatory reform measures that we have taken, is going to lead us on a more sustainable growth path that will lead to more revenue. That's a piece of it, um, but that's a big piece of it. The, I, to, by my way of thinking, the where, what you need to do on the spending side is obvious. I mean, all you need to look, at, all you need to do is look at the speaker's charts. I mean, there's, it's not rocket science. Right. But unless and until you have the votes to do that, doing um, uh, Murray Ryan 2.0 or putting these caps in place, uh, after a year or two, you end up boxing yourself in on either f seen or unforeseen. Uh, set of spending challenges. And, and another point is, and so we have OCO, right, which is your defense spending bill that isn't called defense spending so that you can increase it whenever you'd like. Then we have, and we should do this, but we have uh, 
uh, disaster relief spending, mm -hmm. which isn't part of the budget process because we never know what it's going to be. And so every year there could be, you know, upwards of a couple hundred billion. Uh, I don't want to overstate that, but uh, upwards of a couple hundred billion on spending that we can reasonably prognosticate will happen, if not every year, at least every other year, that we know we're going to have to do, but we're not going to we're not going to embed it in a spending bill because we're already spending too much money to begin with. Yeah, and to that point, you know, the one thing, well, we know we're going to have natural disasters. Uh, we see them almost every year, especially being from Florida. We see it rather frequently. Uh, we just saw what happened to the East Coast of, in the Carolinas. And yet we fail to put a line item in our, in our budget and our appropriations to deal with natural disasters. Instead, we have to go through this protracted disaster relief that gives disaster relief three to six months after the impact right. of the storm or the, or the, 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 the trauma. We could easily, and, and we finally got FEMA to do this, and we're using some of our GSEs uh, to do this, is to cede some of their liability to the private market through reinsurance vehicles. And they did a billion dollars of reinsurance that FEMA bought that was able to access immediately for liquidity purposes to do natural disaster. We should let those who do what they do best deal, trade with the government. For example, we don't build our own planes our own fighter jets, we have somebody do that for us. We should do the same thing in our financial markets so that we don't put taxpayer uh, liability at risk. We should use capital from the capital markets and purchase that because we know we're going to need that relief down the line. But again, logic and reason does not uh, become our compass in this process. Both of you all have mentioned the issue of tough votes or taking a vote and then being villainized by the other party. Um, talk about your toughest vote in Congress, why you took the stand you did, and how other people can uh, take those tough votes themselves. Uh, okay, so full disclosure, I'm in a very competitive district, and so what some people may think is a tough vote is actually an easy <coughs> vote for me, because it means I'm willing to buck my party, or I'm willing to keep government open, uh, or if the base gets agitated at me you know so I don't I, I if I look back I'd really have to think deeply on what a tough vote for me would have been I struggled with some of the CRAs that we voted on um, at the beginning of this Congress more so because I didn't necessarily agree with um, the entire uh, substantive solution to what the problem was identified as by the Obama administration, but I and so there. But so if we're going to roll something back on a rule, I would have liked to see companion legislation that I agreed with. Uh, a, a good example would be on the um, on the privacy uh, bill, you know, and the distinction between ISPs and. Um, and uh, the Facebooks and Googles of the world. And uh, so some of the struggle for me was, yeah, I, I don't agree with this rule. I'm willing to roll it back, but I would like to see what I believe in as part of that, which, which is not how we did it. Um, but I don't regret my vote. I just would have liked to have seen it play out a little bit differently. I'm sure everybody in Congress could say, well, I voted that way. I wish it also would have had this in it, or I wish I could have done that simultaneous with that. But. Probably the toughest vote was my first year, the Budget Control Act of 2011. Uh, that's where uh, we had sequestration results from the passage of that act. We were told by our leadership at the time that sequestration would never take place, that we would resolve an issue, and that the parties would meet in November, and you wouldn't have to worry about sequestration, which would adversely impact so many areas of government, including the Department of Defense. We were also told by the rating agencies, the AMBES out there, that if we didn't pass, uh, a budget in, or a, 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 a debt increase, uh, we were going to have a downgraded rating. But what they failed to say, meaning our leadership, was that the reason they said that is that they said, we will reduce your credit rating unless you put in play a plan to reduce your debt and deficit. That was the big issue. I mean, the, we're here increasing our debt limits, but yet we have no plan in place to reduce it over time. And so the, the rating agency said we were going to lower your the message given to us was, first of all, sequestration never happens, so you got to vote for this. And two, they're going to lower our credit rating, so you better vote for this. Well, I voted against it because they didn't give you the rest of the story. And we went into sequestration, a terrible thing for our Department of Defense, terrible thing for, for our, our, our men and women in uniform. 
And the credit rating agencies did downgrade us. But we never did anything to impose a plan for debt and deficit other than to say we're going to do a balanced budget that will balance in 10 years. Uh, and everybody knowing that you can't bind successive Congresses. So that was probably the toughest vote uh, I think I had. And, and, and after that, we just kind of led in incremental crises. What, what do you all think about uh, when we talked to Congressman Duncan, he raised the challenges of tying party fundraising uh, mm -hmm. to chairmanship positions in the House specifically. Do you all have thoughts on that? And more importantly, the relationship between political fundraising and policy acumen in terms of leadership of committees? So I, I would I would disagree with that characterization. Okay. I, I don't think that steering committee votes on who the next chairman is. There are a lot of variables that go into that. Seniority is at the top of the list. I think policy acumen is number two. Yeah. Um, frankly, in this environment, I think uh, your ability to go on television and defend a position uh, and your media skills is number three. Uh, you used the term fundraising. Uh, I would say that the more supportive you can be towards um, other candidates and uh, your, in your colleagues uh, speaks to your desire to keep a Republican majority and part of governing and, and, and being good on the policy side is making sure that you're putting forth policies that, are, that the, that the um, conference can get behind and that you can sell well. And I don't mean sell in a cheap way. I mean sell in a way that, that expands support for it. So I think that that is, is you didn't say this, but I think that there are those uh, on the outside that, that will issue commentary on this that grossly exaggerate that element of of where it fits in the hierarchy or in the mix of how one becomes a chairman. I mean, the best way to become a chairman is be here a while. <laughs> yeah. You know, th th there is no doubt that in order to maintain your majority, or in order to gain a majority, you have to raise money to do that. And because you have to go out and recruit and fund like-minded candidates so that you can get there. And there are requirements that if you are in certain committees that you have to raise so much uh, money to assist in the overall effort. But as long as we're able to individually give those dollars that we're able to raise to candidates that meet our like-mindedness, uh, then I think it's, it's, it's all part and parcel of the, of the process. Uh, there have been exaggerated uh, uh, stories. One was on 60 Minutes about how everybody spends eight hours a day. That was total it was BS. It was ridiculous. No, I wouldn't do that. Yeah. I wouldn't be here Agree. if I had to spend my time on a phone raising money. And, and I don't do that, and I didn't do that. Um, so, but money is part of the process. We know the other side's doing it. We've got to do that. You know, we all have free speech, but getting it out there ain't free. And so you've got to be able to afford the media, uh, the medium of the media, in order to get it done. Yeah, you know, there's another, there's an interesting uh, way to think about this, and that is look at the number of outside organizations that get seven-figure, eight-figure checks from individuals who can just go into one of our districts and literally just blow our head yeah. off. Um, and so, if you are an elected official, if, if I am, if, if you are my constituents, I would think, if you really thought about it, you would want your representative, who, by the way, files FEC reports every quarter. You know, who, you know, and every single commercial out there these days is how much somebody took from wherever. You, you probably want your representative to be well-funded so that they wouldn't get torpedoed or propped up Think about that, propped up by one or two people from the outside. So I think there's a lot more to it than, uh, than meets the eye. And if you really fully uh, think it through, it's, it's, not, it's not how it's, it's represented by many to be. Is there anything that Congress shouldn't do? And I mean that in terms of, Lots of stuff. topical pro prohibition. We talk about federalism a, a lot. We talk the interplay between states and the federal government. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that Congress is currently focused on either topically or, or in specific legislation that's, hey, this is, this is best left to the states. We need to butt out and let it go. Or is it the case that Congress can kind of put their hand in everything through the Commerce Clause or something along those lines? Well, so you just hit on what I was going to say. Uh, you mentioned the Commerce Clause. Uh, I, there are any number of issue sets. 
where and reasonable people can disagree on this. This is probably more ideological than anything else or philosophical. The preemption clause and what Congress should preempt versus what they shouldn't preempt is probably w where a lot of this gets to intellectually. I think right now, as a Republican, um, I think Congress should preempt states in the realm of uh, technology privacy uh, because I think it's unworkable. I think it would be the same uh, in terms of uh, uh, a lot of the vehicle standards. Um, even on uh, Clean Air Act uh, type, I think that uh, allowing a state to come up with their own plan but, but not allowing states to do their own thing on things that in, impact interstate commerce. You know, else? ideally when our founders created this, this, this system of government. Uh, the, the, the federal government was supposed to be limited in its powers. Uh, precedent based on the Commerce Clause and the federal preemption have taken it to the extent that really the federal government is as large and as big and only going to get bigger, uh, which makes it unfortunate um, f for, I think, the successive generations that now have to deal with that. Um, I I'm of the opinion that we should uh, require Congress to every 10 years review the existing laws on the books and, and to sunset them if they can't justify their reenactment. Because some of these agencies, uh, the, the, the Department of Energy, the, you know, the Department of Education, we need these, but we need to have an opportunity to force ourselves to impose reforms if they're necessary. And if not, then we let them go on. I, I turned on the cable news this morning and was convinced that we're in a Hobbesian state of nature where every man is against every man. Um, you all have both mentioned partisanship, and we see that clearly in the media. Um, is that the case on the ground here in Congress? Are there avenues where members are reaching across the aisle, even if it's in a personal capacity, that we're just not seeing? Or is, or is the image that I see on the TV in the morning on cable news an accurate reflection of where Congress is right now? Well, uh, yes and no, and by that I mean typically that's not the case. An issue will arise or a vote will come up where you see that. I think this president so negatively animates the left that it's become more difficult to, um, to have that collegiality and to get things done because it's very easy right now to be a Democrat and just be against the president and just vote no. Uh, and th where we are, I mean, it's September, 40 days before a midterm, so things kind of, you know, some people are saying things that I don't, I look at them like, really? You, th you don't think that? I know you. Um, at the same point in time, back to your, your other, the point that you made, my feeling is, and maybe it's just because I spend a little more time on social media and I shouldn't, um, it's really everybody against whomever's in office. It doesn't matter if you're a Republican or Democrat. If you're elected, boy, people are pissed off at you. Um, and that, and I think it's because ours do that to D's and D's do that to ours. And so on the outside, it's hard to keep track of all that. So you just decide you don't like any of us, uh, which isn't a good state of affairs. We lose credibility in institutions. To me, that's the defining issue of our time. How do we uh, bring that back? Because you have, I mean, my son's four and a half, but I work, so he's a little too young, but you know, seven, nine, 11, 13 year olds, like what do they think about our democracy and what do they think about politics? I don't think it's good. And I don't think that's good for the health of our institutions and for our country. Congressman Ross. Um, you know, these cable news networks uh, livelihood kind of depends on sensationalism and, and, and uh, headlines and, and uh, viewership. And the best way to do that is to, I think, continue to show a partisan divide, polarization. If you want to raise money on your base, you polarize the other side. Uh, that's just a fact of reality that's done. But if you want to accomplish something in this process that's going to be good, you have to do it, in my opinion, in a bipartisan fashion. Um, if, if, if I were in charge, I would reach across the aisle to whoever my uh, minority leader is, whoever my ranking member is, and say, what is it that you want? What is it that's going to take you to be satisfied with your troops so that I can get what I need to be satisfied for my troops? Because the polarization that exists today where it's either our way or no way is going to come around and haunt us if we lose the majority. And it's going to be practiced again. And you set the precedent, as Ryan pointed out so well, that this next generation looks and says, wow, everybody hates each other and everybody's against each other. Yes, the left may want bigger government. And yes, the right way may want smaller government. But I think if you get them all together, they would all agree we don't want bad government. 
And so keeping bad government out of the way is a constant debate and struggle. One way to avoid that is to focus on what our commonalities are. How much time do we spend up here focusing on commonalities, which if we did, we would find we'd spend more time on that because there's more in common than there is in difference, but we don't. It requires some strong leadership that's gonna put their leadership at risk in order to be able to take this polarization away, and that means even defying some of what this president is doing um, in terms of, of personality, not in terms of policy, in my opinion. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's, it's something that we have to address. It's something that the next generation is gonna look at and say, I don't even wanna get involved, it's so nasty. We have time for one or two questions from folks in attendance. <coughs> yes, sir. So I think that they are. I'm on the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, first term I was on uh, T&I and, and veterans. And uh, both T&I and, and veterans are, are highly functioning bipartisan committees that a lot of stuff gets done. I mean, when I leave here, uh, my I have two Energy and Commerce Committee hearings today. <laughs> and uh, one is on, let's see if I have it. One is hearing built in America, jobs and growth in the manufacturing sector. The other one is solutions to strengthening U.S. public um, emergency response efforts. Uh, point there is simply there's a lot of substantive hearings that are just trying to drill down so that we understand what the issue sets are and the challenges are and then figuring out where we can actually get a, a bipartisan consensus. We have a lot of markups where we're marking up uh, or voting out of committee unanimously 65 bills you know 50 bills at a time um, and they get to the floor and they vote on their you know it's they're done by suspension uh, the big stuff health care some energy stuff you know you're gonna see uh, differences and you're gonna think that oh they can't get along but it's not that they're just you know we're fighting on on policy grounds I still think it works very well occasionally you'll get frustration in in committees probably appropriations which you sit on more than anywhere else where leadership will just take it out of committee and say all right enough we're doing it um, but I also think that that sometimes things can get bogged down in committee yeah, I had the experience. Actually, I, I serve on financial services. I'm uh, sorry. No, no, that's right. We, but years ago, we had a flood insurance issue uh, that uh, was coming up. It was the uh, Bigger Waters uh, bill, and uh, the chairman at the time of the Financial Services Committee wasn't moving it in the way the leadership wanted. The leadership took the bill out of committee and put it on the floor the way they wanted it. I think that, that the committee should be the arena by which we do investigation and research and recommendations to the full, uh, to the full house. Is it always that way? No. Uh, I would rather have seen us take on immigration uh, in committee. We didn't do that. I would rather have seen us take on infrastructure in committee the way we should have. We haven't done that. Um, you know, we for a long time, longest time, the first six six years, we talked about how we were going to repeal health care, and never once did we offer in committee a plan to replace health care. So that when we had the majority, it was like, oh my goodness. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> totally. What do we do now? Totally right. Yeah. yeah so, uh, right here. Uh, you talked about. Uh, when I f <laughs> first was elected, I think I maybe spent my first term like maybe five hours a week, maybe at the most 10 between calls and attending events too. Remember, you go to an event, that's, you know, two hours of your time. Uh, my second term very little. I mean, I just show up for events. Remember, you're paying people to make your calls and do your events and yada, yada, yada. And then they're drilling down so that if you actually have to like call, do that kind of stuff, you know, that's a small period of time because part of their job is to make sure you're not spending a lot of time on that. Right. Um, so and there, so there again, I don't think for, I will say this to you. Uh, my second term, it became much more difficult locally because people were either so pro-Trump 
that it, God forbid you said anything negative, they were pissed at you. And then you had other folks that were agitated about him, and so therefore, because you didn't voice your agitation to the degree, degree they wanted, um, they, they were bothered by that. And then you had this third group that was partly listening to the president, like, we need to get stuff done, so well, until we get stuff done, I, you know, call me later. So that, that was the biggest challenge to me, actually, was the year, uh, last year, um, with local folks. The D.C. stuff is kind of like on autopilot. You know, you got your PAC directors out there, and, you know, they just do all that stuff, and you show up. That's why I don't think it's – when people get b bothered by how much time their member may do that stuff, I have to be honest with you, it's not that overwhelming of a thing. It's really not. That's my. That's been my experience. Now I'm on energy yeah, and commerce, true. so it's a little bit easier. You know, I I, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't do this job if I had to spend that inordinate amount of time raising money. And I come from a rural area where I have to raise about 1.2 million dollars to run a campaign and then do some fundraising for the for the uh, for the party. In addition, you can't do that locally, uh, so you'll travel you'll travel to more affluent areas throughout the country and and uh, and do events to be able to do that. Uh, but I've never been a slave to fundraising. In fact, I've, I've been kind of quiet about raising money unless I need it. And, and when you want to talk about, well, look at all the money they're raising. Well, as Brian pointed out, you do a filing with the FEC, the Federal Elections Commission. It's that all, is transparent. It's all right like there. If you like what they're getting their money source from, then vote against them. Um, yeah, well, and, then you, and then you have the TV folks who go on there about how it's ridiculous, yada, yada, yada. And the reason you got to raise the money is because you got to put televisions on, <laughs> you got <laughs> commercials on television, and they got jack up their rates around election time. <laughs> Last question. You know, I, in the 70s, when they started the the, uh, the sunshine provisions, the government will now be in the sunshine. I don't think that was a bad thing. I think that in order to have faith in the government, you have to have some sense of transparency to see what is going on. Now, ultimately, as we have seen, and we will see probably as we get closer to the lame duck session, there will be legislation that never saw the, the light of a committee, uh, even an open or closed committee, um, and, and we will be voting on that. I, those types of tactics abhor me, but I understand that they're also still part of the process. Look, a benevolent dictator would be the best thing we could ever have, uh, but it's not going to happen because there is no such person that would ever because of human nature. But our democracy requires citizen participation, and if we're going to close them out of the, part, the, the, the process by not allowing them to view what's going on, I think we, we create a greater apathy uh, and more harm in the long run. Uh, there's a lot of, I mean, if I were to, um, sort of open up, there's a lot, you said a lot, <laughs> and there's a lot of different things, uh, ways to approach your question. Uh, transparency is a good thing, always, until you have elected officials speaking to, uh, people unrelated to actually solving their problem, but looking to make themselves, trying to make themselves look good. Um, and, you know, you, you, look, we are all sophisticated enough on social media to recognize a self-congratulating politician's tweet a mile and a half away. And, and it gets old quick. 
And my feeling is that there are times, uh, and they're usually when no one's attending the hearings that are still televised, where you get great questions from members. If you're dealing with a very contentious issue, look, I did a Facebook energy and commerce hearing. I, I always find it's better to look at your own side rather than the other if you're going to try and make a good point here, where 20% where of the questions were about diamond and silk. <laughs> and they're not having their whatever up on Facebook anymore. It's just like, really? Like, of all the challenges we have in our democracy and the way technology is up, really destabilizing, and, and, and this is the other point I was going to make to you, is we all felt that Facebook and Twitter, this was going to open up our democracy more. We're going to have better relations. And there is, there is compelling evidence that suggests that what we thought, that, ut that utopia of what it would be, is actually not happening right now. What we are doing is eating ourselves alive and just figuring out a new way to be pissed off about something every day. <laughs> and that's not healthy for us. That doesn't mean we shut those platforms down. I think we still have to evolve beyond them. And I think the issue of transparency is one where sometimes you take one step forward, two steps back before you get to take three steps forward. And so we're all, I think that's always going to be the issue with uh, new efforts to create transparency. But you can't stop that momentum because to go in the other direction, I think, is, is even more uh, is it would would do more to undermine the credibility of institutions than add to it. Well, gentlemen, the red light is on, and uh, we thank you for your time. Thank and you, our street.